But I want to read something to you that's, sure. that's concerning because we're playing a little bit of the slippery slope with the, the trans uh, uh, side, right? And so this story comes like California trans child molester, Hannah Tubbs, gloats over light sentence and jailhouse phone calls, okay? Explicit Los Angeles jailhouse recordings of Hannah Tubbs, a 26-year-old trans child molester who re- received a slap on a wrist in January after pleading guilty to molesting a 10-year-old in 2014, depict her admitting it was wrong to attack a little girl, but gloating over the light punishment. Tubbs pleaded guilty last month to the cold case attack, which took place in a woman's restroom at Denny's Restaurant when the suspect, who was two weeks shy of 18 and identified as a male named James Tubbs, after being arrested roughly eight years after the crime, Tubbs began identifying as a woman. She received a sentence of two years at a juvenile facility because Democrat District Attorney Gorgia Mosgrove was so, okay, so how, how, how concerned are you with what's happening today with the trans side where laws are almost protecting against? I think somebody even had a, did somebody have a sex change to prevent from having a long sentence? This was a two months ago story. Do you remember that one story where somebody did this? How much of a slippery slope are we dealing with when it comes down to, the, to this uh, topic Well, I think here? if you take this case and isolate it, I think the more the, the question is, you know, did this person? I mean, take the trans out of it for a minute. There was a sexual assault of a minor, uh, but they didn't catch the person until they were older. So at the time of the crime, what was the age difference? Now, gloating about getting away with it is horrible and wrong, and and that person probably deserved a, a higher sentence. I'm not so sure that in this case, being trans had anything to do with the sentence. I think it had more to do with the age of the person when the crime was committed. And I know that there there have been a lot of criticisms of this particular district attorney out there. And I know people who work in that office who think that you know he's too light on some of these crimes and they don't go after some of this stuff aggressively enough. But I think in this case, the trans issue gets a headline because of what it is, but the real matter of the case is that somebody got away with a light sentence, whether they're trans or not. Yeah. You so, so you know the, the the topic about, you know, the pizza guy, okay, mm-hmm. with the pizza. He's like, well, it was consent. Yeah, like, no, what do you mean you consent? You can't She's consent 13. Yeah, what are you talking about, right? Yeah, no, this is a guy. He had a yeah. marriage contract. This guy yeah. was a bad guy, yeah. right? And I've gone back to some of these guys to 44 try 44 years old yeah, at the time, yeah. Yeah, Jeff Sokol. And I went back to him to reach out, to, as I do with many of these guys, to get them to see if they'll talk to me on the podcast. Because I think it would be interesting, and, and I'm in discussions with some of them who I think may do it. Actually. Jeff said yes? Jeff said no. Okay, I'm not surprised. But yeah. here, so, so maybe if you brought some awesome the, pizza, the, he'd show Yeah, they planted pizza from the part. The part about the slippery slope is, you know, uh, the law today states what? At what age... Uh, 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 if you have sex with a minor, it's what, 18? It's under 18? <clears throat> Depending on the state, okay. right? It's different, but it, it can be, it's usually 18 unless both parties are under 18. So in other words, if, if, if a 15-year-old girl has sex with a 16-year-old boy in a lot of states, that's not illegal, Right, because the, the age difference. If, you if mean the, in if some the, states it is illegal? In, no, in, in some states it may be. I don't know the law oh, okay. in every state, but I yeah. know that in many states, if both parties are within a year of each other and underage, it's not illegal. If one party is 30 and one is 15, then that's illegal, right? And then the gray area comes when somebody, as you mentioned earlier, yeah. somebody's 16, somebody's 19. Is that inappropriate? I can tell you that during our investigations, the profile of the of the, the target is at the oldest 14 because it takes that gray area out of it. So in other words, if it's a 19-year-old and a 13, 14, yeah. 13, or 12-year-old child, you can say, well, he's only 19. But then I would argue that, okay, what's the difference between a 19-year-old violating a 12-year-old and a 38-year-old? What's the difference? I brought this up to, to a, a guy I was speaking to uh, about the uh, 19-year-old and the 15-year-old. Mm-hmm. And I said, what do you think about that? Well, you know, that's, that's not uh, cool. Uh, you shouldn't be doing that. I said, right. okay, how about a 60-year-old dating a 20-year-old? Mm-hmm. Well, sixteen. I think I think a twenty-year-old is of legal age yeah. in terms of consent. So, you know, it may look creepy, but it's not illegal. Yeah. So, so the 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 law for me that I'm going to with trans is the following: they're trying to pass. Are you following the story that they're trying to 
allow a minor to make a decision to have a sex change. How does that? And they're talking in, about this in, in DC. Seattle. In Seattle, the minor doesn't even have to get the parent's permission, and it's against the law for the physician to tell the parent that the minor wants a sex change. Right. This is happening in a lot of places across the country. Well, I think you you know you get into a really complicated area here because, and I'm not expert in it by any stretch of the imagination, but I do you know read up on it because, you know, it's interesting. Um, there are cases where somebody at a young age thinks they want to have gender reassignment surgery and then has regrets afterwards. Now, how do you put that back together once it's happened? So just like in a lot of other areas, you know, there's mandatory counseling before you take certain steps. And it would seem this is one of them. And again, you know, this is all new. So we're all making this up as we go along. We don't know. But there there is information out there that suggests that in a certain number of cases, People feel that they want to do this, and then they have regrets and second thoughts, and they want to reverse it. And that's difficult, if not impossible. Washington laws now allow teen gender reassignment surgery without parental consent. That's just weird to me. You tell me how that makes any sense. What comes after that? You know, what comes after that to say, what's wrong with a 22-year-old dating a 13-year-old? I mean, I'm from Iran. In Iran, the the age used to be a 50-year-old man could marry a... 13-year-old girl, and mm-hmm. when the Shah got elected, I think he raised it to 15, maybe 18. It's back down to 13 today, by the way. Today, yeah. a 50-year-old man can marry 13, I think. It's 13 years old right now, and it's normal there. What if now, you know, stories like this end up passing, and people say, oh, you got to, it's their choice, it's their choice. And then people say, I think 18 is, is, is too old. I think we got to lower that to 15. Should we fight that? <laughs> it's a law, right? Should we say, okay, what if there comes a time where they change the law from 18 to 15? And... Half the country agrees, and they say, what's wrong with that? What, what are we doing now? Now people can't say, well, that's just the law now. We have to follow that law. Well, I think sometimes common sense loses out, and I think we have to find this middle ground. You know, we get so polarized in so many aspects of politics and everything else that we're going through today. You know, you get to the COVID thing. I mean, yes, there's a great story there, and I'm talking to a lot of people about that. Is it hard to get to China? Yes. Is it hard to get the truth out of China? Absolutely. I've been there. I've done stories there. But we do lose common sense sometimes, and I think this is an area. I mean, I don't think a 13-year-old should be able to decide on their own surgery, no matter what the surgery is. We're on the same page. And I think parents have to be involved millions are on the same page with you. I can tell you this. And, and this is the only thing in this whole area that I can tell you for sure, is that when you have a potential transgender issue in your family, the rate of suicide is dramatically lower when a family is open and accepting and has a discussion. Hmm. That I can tell you. That I know for a fact. Other than that, you know, we're making new new decisions in, a, in, a, in an area that we haven't dealt with before. How, how much do we have transgenderism in the 20s? So go to 20s and 30s. What was transgenderism in the 20s and 30s? Like this whole thing to say if it's accepted by parents. Uh, didn't, didn't, didn't we just read an article that said the number one step to, uh, you know, somebody abusing your kid, the first uh, step is to win the trust of who? The parents. I mean, that's the same argument as saying, uh, Chris, I may be wrong, is to say, let's first get the parents to accept the concept of their kids wanting to go through it. Mm -hmm. And then once we win the parents over, and then we can get the kids. But we first have to get the parents to think that it's normal. Because... Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if, you know, this topic was a topic and I'd love to get more of the history of it on when it started. You know, I'd love to see, uh, in the thirties, was it a normal thing? Was it normal to talk about these types of surgeries? I mean, I know it's been around for a while, but I want to know the, 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 what's the word? I want to know the history, not only the history of it, you know, again, from an investigative journalistic uh, standpoint, like uh, I want to know the out of a thousand people that did the surgery, I want to know the profile. I want to know the parenting. I want to know at what age. I want to know, you know, uh, 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 siblings. Do they have an older sister, older brother? What's the relationship with the older brother, sister? Was there an abusive uncle or person? I want, I want to investigate that. I want to know that. But we're so afraid to investigate that. 
All we're investigating is, well, parents should be more acceptable about this, 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 and that. And I think rather than doing that, we're not putting the time into the real conversation, which is, oh, you know, suicide in the military. Why does suicide in the military happen? What is it? What causes suicide in the military to happen? You know, is it uh, away from the family? Did some people join the military to get away from the family? Are they running away from family? You mean to tell me everybody that joins the army is that patriotic? I have a hard time believing it. When I was in the military, I had a lot of guys that were in the military. They were not in there because they were patriotic. Mm -hmm. There were people that were in the military that actually didn't like the country. They were just people in the military for GI Bill. Some were there because they couldn't stand their dad. They wanted to get away. And we had stories of, uh, 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 what do you call it, Uh, suicide. And it's heartbreaking. You know, I had one of my... Uh, close uh, uh, friends from uh, you know military that went through it and I saw his relationship with his father his father would slap him in the face in front of us and I'm like I can't I can't even be around it his father was so abusive to him in front of all of us and he would be so embarrassed when he was around us so he never felt like he could do anything to please his dad and eventually he took his life was that the reason so education is what it comes down right. to is where I'm going. And so, awareness and yeah, a dialogue. That's all I want to know. I, like when you said, you said something about James O'Keefe, you said that's an opinion. And then he said, Oliver Stone is an opinion, right? That's an opinion. Well, the opinion is on both sides, sure. right? Absolutely. You, you said you want to get to, what was the word you used? Not the truth. You said you want to do, uh, uh, you given, which I agree with. You want to find out the why, let's just say, right? right? I the want origin, to know the, the why. origin. Of the origin. It. I want to know yeah. the why. I want to know, you know, there's a lot of questions I got. I want to know, do we really make the right choice going to war in Iraq? You know, and we're like, oh, that weapon is a mass destruction. Guess what? What was that all about? What was this whole thing with the way we handled Afghanistan? That was catastrophic. We just lost $80 billion. This whole thing going on with Russia and Ukraine right now, what is the real motive? Does America, is America using Ukraine as a proxy to get rid of Putin? We don't know. I want to know. I'm curious, right? I'm curious to know. What some of the some of the things are historically, y- you haven't been in this space for a while. Who's who was the name of people that would go investigate the heavy duty topics that would come and give the most uh, uh, fair assessment from both sides? I mean, Cronkite was more of a personality guy, but who right. was like the investigative journalist that would give both sides of the story? Just well, say Wallace. I, I, yeah, I think uh, I think the sixty minutes guys, obviously, and, and Mike Wallace, sure. Um, Our friend John Stossel. Stossel did a lot of great work over the years. Um, in, in a whole combination, Walt Bogdanovich, you know, at the New York Times and other places, <clears throat> and the whole teams of, of, of print reporters who would go after this. The Chicago Tribune, going back to, you know, the, the meatpacking uh, industry, uh, you know, Upton Sinclair and, you know, uh, talking about all that. It, Chicago, the Chicago Papers did a great thing where they opened up a bar mm-hmm. and they – saw everybody hit them up for bribes, the inspectors and the what contractors. A, it was, it, but it was, it was seminal. We once <clears throat> had a story put together where we had some guys come in and we were going to open up a, a gentleman's club, a strip club, and watch the people come in in New York City. We had a location and everything, from the mob supplying the dancers to the people inspecting the place to do the whole thing and then put hidden cameras in and capture the whole thing. And the lawyers ended up nixing it because there are admittedly a lot of issues doing that. Um, you know, how long do you run it? But <laughs> the interesting thing was that the guys who were consulting with me on it said that they could pay for the entire project with the proceeds of actually having a club in Queens. And it, it got pretty high up <laughs> at NBC. <laughs> we know we we're going to open us. We had a name for it, the whole thing. Didn't happen. And it didn't happen. Well, and, and I understand why. I mean, uh, the legal questions were just overwhelming and strangling of doing something No like that. question. But, I mean, yeah. but, and then, you know, you're operating this thing, and you've got legitimate people working there, people going there as customers. Do you, you know, what do you do? You, you wire the place with hidden cameras? And that's constitutionally iffy. I mean, it'd be great television, but, I mean, the Lord, <laughs> and, and the best part was in the pitch meeting, I said, and it pays for itself, yeah. you know, because we'd raise, it was going to be 400 grand to do it, and I think we're going to make back 400 grand in the first year. And we actually had former federal and local law enforcement people who could, were going to consult on this, who had done this for other investigations. And it was, I thought it was genius, but I understood at the end of the day what the, why it was so 400 grand to do it, and you're going to get 400 grand back. I mean, that would be 
perfect TV right well, there. Well, yeah, but then, mm-hmm. you know, you got a guy who goes into a club like that for one night and he gets captured on a hidden camera. You know, what do you do with that? Yeah. And you got a woman who's working in that business because she's trying to feed her kids. What do you do with that? At what point does it become exploitive versus interesting, notwithstanding all the other legal issues? If you enjoyed this short clip, click over here to watch another short clip. And if you want to watch the entire episode, the entire podcast, click here.